Um, so yeah, good morning. Um, as George said, my name is Kate Pearce um, and I work in plant biosecurity for Northwest Local Land Services. Um, my job um, day to day involves a lot of proof of freedom surveillance work. Um, and often when exotics become endemic, um, I do a lot of surveillance and management in that space. Um, so thanks for having me today. Um, I won't take up too much time at all. I just wanted to touch on pasture dieback um, this morning. The purpose of this prezzo, I suppose, um, is more to raise awareness more than anything um, on this subject. We predict that we will see pasture dieback um, most likely in the north part of, part of the state, so around south of Gundawindi um, and there are parts of, I suppose, the most eastern parts of the Tablelands where it already exists. Um, and obviously it's very heavily um, spread on the north coast as it stands. But um, yeah, this is not, not to be alarmed, this presentation, it's to be aware. Um, so you know what it looks like and if you see anything suspect um, to give the plant um, pest um, hotline a call or myself um, and we can go from there. Um, so yeah, as I said, it's creeping into the eastern part, very eastern part of the tablelands. Um, so better to be aware of what it looks like. Um, there are no guarantees as to where it will show up um, and this will make sense shortly. Um, so what is pasture dieback? It is a condition that kills sown native um, summer grasses, growing grasses, so C4s mainly. Um, pasture dieback is characterised as patches of grasses um, <clears throat> and in more severe cases, larger areas or whole paddocks um, being affected. Initially, where the older leaves get affected, they start to turn um, yellow or reddish or both um, and discolour. Um, and as the condition progresses, the whole plant um, will turn the black, turn orangey, um, yellowy, reddy, sorry. Um, and become ill thrifty and start to die. Um, and yeah, and that is sort of the, the end stage um, where you have big dead clumps, as you can see in this picture, those pictures, this is all from the North Coast, I will say something. Um, a lot of this information has come from Nathan Jennings at the North Coast. Um, he works um, on the ag team with the North Coast LLS and has done a lot of this work um, with Terry Rose at Southern Cross University. LLS have put a lot of funding into um, research for New South Wales, um, but pasture dieback is, um, is no um, new issue to Australia. It's been in Queensland for quite some time. Um, and MLA and QDAF have done a lot of work um, in this space over the years. So we have, we have a lot of information behind us, but how it looks in every situation um, is always different. So yeah, as you can see here, there um, are a few different pictures here where it looks quite severe on the far side. Um, and, and still, I would say it's still quite severe in the second one. And that's sort of a close up of, of um, where it looks when it starts to turn, it gets quite thatched and um, yeah, it looks that way. Um, so what is the cause of pasture dieback? You've probably heard a lot from, like I said, from Queensland. Um, there's a lot of school, schools of thought of what, to, what causes pasture dieback, um, but we are just going with what we know um, and what we're seeing in New South Wales. So we are finding pasture mealy bug, so the strain summer vilii, um, everywhere where um, we have found pasture dieback in New South Wales to date. Um, so yeah, so, so far for New South Wales, as I said, any reported site that has been sampled and tested has had um, this pasture mealy bug present. Um, so important thing to note, mealy bug, as most of you would be aware, is wind spread. Um, and that is, yeah, I suppose key. When we talk about, um, I suppose, farm practices when it comes to come clean, go clean and moving farm machinery about um, on the north coast, I just wanted to mention, I suppose when it started in the Tweed, there was a lot of, um, I suppose, conjecture as to who's spreading it, but mealybug, as you all know, is an insect and is um, windborne. Uh, as you can see, pasture mealybug, like I said, is what is most common, but um, in Queensland, there have been ground pearls um, and other, other, other signs and symptoms 
also present when it comes to, I suppose, labelling um, pasture dieback. Um, just going back one slide, sorry. Um, at the front, there is this very handy um, you guide that Suze Boschmar, Sarah Baker from DPI, who are in the room today, um, Nathan Jennings also from the North Coast and Stuart Buck from QDAF have put together. This has, it has everything you need to know about dieback. So please take one and put it in your glove box. Hopefully you'll never need it, but um, it's a very, very handy resource. Um, and I would highly recommend taking one. Um, and also there is this um, document also put together between DPI and MLA, um, just another quick go-to of the, I suppose, most tolerant to highly susceptible um, species. Um, there is still a lot of work happening in this space with um, tolerance and susceptibility. So I wouldn't take it all as Bible, but it is a very, very good guide um, on that. Um, so just, um, the nature of pasture dieback, how fast can it spread? It depends on the growing conditions heavily. Um, so as slow as a centimetre squared per week in the drier to cooler months um, and in a rapid, rapid cases, um, a hectare per week in warm, humid months with adequate rainfall. Um, the country can and will recover. Um, it could be a process of as quick as one to six years. Um, you will see this in the Ute Guide, um, pasture dieback recovery, um, I suppose, sort of illustrated where you have the picture. The first picture is in um, 2018, and this is in Queensland, um, of a Rhodes grass pasture paddock. Um, and then it's the, the same, very same picture, as you can tell, with those sheds in the background um, in June 2019. Um, and then, again, the whole... Uh, pasture has recovered and grown back again in 2021. So that's roughly a four year process um, right there. So it is, um, it, is, it is an all dire, but yeah, there's a lot of things to be aware of and to consider. Um, so just to paint a bit of a picture, uh, going back to when it, I suppose, first established, established itself in New South Wales, back in 2020. Um, in 2019, um, the pastures team here in LLS did a lot of, um, I suppose, reconnaissance in getting ourselves up to speed with uh, pasture dieback. And we did a stint up in Queensland, learning as much as we could from the Queenslanders um, about, about pasture dieback. So in 2019, we sort of had an inkling that um, we'd seen um, areas along the border and on a few TSRs in northwest LLS where we thought um, signs and symptoms looked diebacky, but um, coming out of a severe drought and still in drought, it's hard to um, label that because, yeah, moisture, st moisture stress and dieback look very similar. Um, I just want you to take note on this map of um, the north coast. So, you can see, obviously, you can see up here the tweed is where it sort of started to pilfer down. Um, coming into the south of the state and heading out west. Just take note of those circles where Byron, Lismore, Kyogle and Casino are for the next slide. So that's March 2020 to September 2022. This is <coughs> pasture dieback last um, spring to March this year. As you can see, it has, I'll just move it back just for reference. As you can see, um, the growing conditions um, with the amount of rainfall last spring through to um, autumn this year were, uh, I suppose, the perfect storm for dieback in the way that you can see it's moved a lot um, down through that casino area and then um, Lismore, uh, Kyogle are quite, are quite filled in. Um, this, this area is still yet to be mapped um, by Southern Cross University and North, uh, not Northwest, North Coast LLS. Um, with updated, um, I suppose, areas of where dieback is. Um, so that's obviously from March this year to May this year, um, where it's pushing east into the tablelands there. Um, so yeah, it, um, it was sort of the perfect storm last year. Uh, the mealybug really likes, <clears throat> and why it was, I, would, I will say, 
is um, it really, I suppose, thrives in thatched areas where it's got a lot of canopy cover um, and, yeah, a lot of protection. So it's sort of when it's in that situation, it just, um, it does go a bit nuts and it seems to thrive. Um, so actions to minimise spread, obviously, good on-farm biosecurity practices is a must, come clean, go clean approach in, in, any, um, in any facet of your farming life, not just when it comes to pasture dieback, but um, yeah, so having a farm biosecurity plan, risk-based and practical. Um, treat anything that could move dieback affected plant material as a means of spread. Hay and silage, um, like you all are aware, think about where it's coming from, um, commodity vendor decks, having all that stuff, um, yeah, dotting your T's and crossing your I's there. But I suppose if you can avoid it, um, don't, don't buy um, hay out of the North Coast or parts of Queensland. But um, look, you can, you can only do what you can do, but it's not, um, it's not a means to say that it will or will not, but it would just be something I'd, um, I would suggest to avoid if you can. But I don't think you'd be getting much hay out of North Coast at the moment. They're pretty dry too. Um, so yeah, no pattern or consistency in move, movement of livestock um, and spread of pasture dieback within or across um, properties. Heavy grazing um, has been used to help slow the spread. Um, so removing that biomass is really key. Obviously, you don't want to overgraze anything um, because obviously that, that poses a lot of risks as well. Um, but you do want to, there's sort of a fine line with having that thatch layer removed. A lot of the guys on the north, north coast where they can were slashing um, a lot of their paddocks um, to get the feed down. Obviously in good, good times over there, the feed is probably more than they have um, enough cow's mouths to eat. So they were doing that in a lot of cases to um, slow the spread and they saw good results from that. Um, as, as it says there, cattle tend to avoid symptomatic plants, rather they will graze obviously the healthy material um, in the paddock and um, seems to prevent as a rapid progression. So that's no, I suppose, um, uh, nothing surprising there. Um, this is just a little, I suppose, um, picture to show you the illustration of um, the impact. So reduced stocking rate can be from 30 to 50 percent is common to de-stock de in some cases. Now, please remember this is from the north coast, so the size of the farms um, and the areas they have are obviously very different to, um, to how we are set up out here. Um, but yeah, I suppose it just sort of shows you March 2020, June 20, 2020, um, and then that is January, January 2021. Um, so management and interventions will come at a cost. Um, heavy grazing, um, costs are variable, generally cheap, um, and needs to, um, need, you need to have suitable infrastructure. Um, slashing and mulching where arable is, this is, this again, all economics coming off the coast, um, $104 per hectare. Um, per pass, so spray and barely, spray merely bugs by tractor and ground boom. Um, Movento and Comfador are the two insecticides used. Um, broadleaf weed control obviously depends on the product, but ranges from $35 um, per hectare for application. Sowing annual species, winter and summer, costs from $650 up to $800 per hectare. Um, and then reselling perennial legumes, $400 plus, and um, perennial grasses, $300 plus. Um, I suppose the key messages are, I'm sorry, that's not, not so small up there. Um, it is a significant th threat to grazing enterprises. Um, on the North Coast, obviously, it is where is, it is really bad. And like I said, I hope we never have to, to do too much with it. But um, yeah, in time, potentially, it could be in a lot of parts of New South Wales. Um, just because it's in one district doesn't mean everyone will be affected. As I said at the start, this is good to be alert, not alarmed. Um, the country will eventually recover, um, but minimising environmental and financial costs is critical. Um, it can be managed and can be pre and can present opportunities. Um, obviously, science and, and cost benefit approach needs to be um, addressed. Um, management techniques will be unique and individual to each farm, depending how they're set up, um, and obviously a cost benefit approach. 
sorry. Um, so yeah, if you see, I suppose, anything um, like I have described today, um, as it dries up, it's hard to sort of tell the difference. Um, in not in in a few ways, but obviously, if you've got a high a burden of mealy bugs present, then that's probably a fairly telltale sign. Call the plant biosecurity hotline. That'll come through to the pastures team, being Sarah's and Sue's. Um, so that one eight hundred number, or myself, which is that mobile number, if you see any signs of dieback. Um, and I just wanted to quickly touch on. Um, the North Coast management trials. So as I said before, um, LLS have put a lot of funding into Southern Cross University at Lismore and headed up by a guy named Terry Rose. Um, so they're just doing a few, um, I suppose, re-sowing of tropical grasses, um, soil nutrition um, and health, looking at 10 fertilisers and 10 microbial treatments, um, and then biomass management. So frequent heavy rotation, um, grazing to, I suppose, assess, um, yeah, the best management practices going forward um, there. We are doing some workshops, raising awareness in the next two months, um, more in the border areas around Gundy and Bogger, um, where we foresee we will see pasture dieback. Um, but, um, yeah, that is, that is where it stands to, to date. So thank you. Any questions? You just said that uh, if you change your pasture balance, grasses balance, that's, uh, that helps in their progression on your farm. Is that correct? Uh, some people have, yes. Um, so um, along in the north coast, um, and you will see in these, um, on page eight of this book, it'll tell you what's, I suppose, mildly susceptible, highly susceptible. Um, so a lot of the tropicals on the north coast have been smashed. Um, so they have, in in some in some um, cases, they have um, changed up their uh, mixes and re-sown. I suppose the the plants that are coping a lot better. And Ceteria seems to be the one that um, stands up to against all the rest. Um, on the north coast, which they have planted a lot more, but that'll obviously be different here. So uh, they prefer native grasses? Not necessarily, that's not right. Not necessarily, no. As in merely bug? Yeah. Um, no, not necessarily, but they, uh, like I said, they do, we only know what we know, and they do seem to smash the, the tropicals on the north coast. So when they blow into your place, um, you had some slides up there that said like four years and the pasture will recover. Yes. Um, is that recover without doing anything or is that recover after you've sprayed them um, and then waited to see what the, the effect of that has and then going ahead and crossing your fingers and uh, toes and hoping it's, that in four it's years. A good, it's a good question. This is what, what I'll highlight is that not, not, one, not, one, not one way of doing anything will suit every situation. So there's areas in the North Coast where they have say slashed, slashed a paddock where they've noticed, um, noticed it creeping in in places and then they may have topped it um, and re-sown and that's worked well for them. There's places where they haven't done anything and it's just come good. So yeah, that's... I suppose that's why it's um, it's good to speak with either the DPI or ourselves to um, to look at all your options when it comes to managing it, um, just as one. So do you know do you know then that if a pasture is in distress, e.g. drought, being overgrazed, whatever? Yes. That they they come in, and you've got some regrowth going on, and they come in. Do they really take care of the pasture and wipe it out because of being under stress and? or do they just like herbage and just bore in it? It, it? it generally seems to be when they have gone nuts, so to speak, is when um, you haven't been in drought, you have had a moderately good season, but it's sort of a sweet spot like last year, for example, and it's shown on this slide from here to here, um, that they had a really good spring start of summer rainfall. So they were set up and they had a lot of, a lot of good feed um, and they had a really thatched process, like thatched, when I say thatched, have I got a good picture? Like here, where it is very thatched. Um, so when the mealybug obviously get under the leaf 
um, and in 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 that plant space, um, yeah, they do seem to move really quickly and you seem to see the damage really quickly. So it's sort of a perfect storm of, of having a good spring start of summer where you've got a lot of feed and then, um, yeah, it progresses and you don't, if, if you have a really wet summer, then it's not going to move as quickly. Well, that's what they've seen on the North Coast. Like it did in the tweed, it did move, but it didn't seem to as move as quickly as it did last spring and summer, if that makes sense. So. so a lot of it is that area at the top surface gets very hard and you can't penetrate it. So either using something to tillage it sometimes will help. Um, using your mixed species that will penetrate like your tillage radishes. Um, if you're going to use grasses, so, sorry Kate. Just, you're right, you go. Yours has been on the coast, but here you can use, in this cooler country, you could use your endophyte ryegrasses. Endophytes actually uh, deflect the mealybugs. Um, everyone knows endophytes and, and how they work. So if you can use a ryegrass, use an endophyte ryegrass. Um, if you're going to use a tropical, use a, a coated one that has an insecticide in it like gaucho because that will then pass through the systemic to the plant and help it fight the insect pressure. Uh, but there's a lot of things that are happening, like I've seen paddocks that are a four bar fence and that paddock's chewed out and this paddock's green is flush. So it comes back to the architecture of the plant. Um, your question, Brett, about you know how it flops it out, well, <coughs> I've seen gained a buffalo on one side of the fence smashed and on that side of the fence billow buffalo and it's green, lush, grazing cattle like no tomorrow. Yeah. So there's no right or wrong, but the biggest thing is, is try and bust up that soil. And that picture there, like that middle picture, like that's useless, you can't use it. However, legumes will survive uh, dieback. So put a, a legume in it, whether it be annuals, whatever, but any legumes. Kate, I noticed you mentioned at the start that every site you've found mealybug on the scene is that they're on the crime scene, but are they the primary cause or is there a virus, fungi or bacterial association that's, with the presence of that that's causing the dieback? That's a very good question um, and I probably should have made that clear at the start. Um, when they did start to find it, they sent it away and tested it for everything under the sun. And they did that for the first, I'm not even sure how many tests in the first season. And then all that was, so all the mealybugs that they tested were DNA tested back to Queensland to this, this Somervillii strain. Um, and the biggest common denominator is the Somervillii strain and everything else doesn't um, seem to paint a consistent picture. So that's what I will say. Um, and in Northwest, knowing that, we would start to obviously, um, I think, um, we wouldn't rule out everything to start with when if when and if when and if hopefully we don't see it but um, yeah the way the way the management I suppose protocol has gone over there with testing they started testing for everything under the sun for a very long time nothing was coming back that made any sense apart from the mealybug being present and um, yeah it being the strain of pasture mealybug well I'm not saying you can't but from what we've seen in New South Wales, that's what we know.